Hey everyone, welcome back to our second video on local anesthetics. And just a quick caveat for this video, this content is probably lower yield than the previous video for exam preparation purposes, but it's certainly important and very clinically relevant. And that is the topic of injections and local anesthetic technique. And this is certainly not a comprehensive look into each and every detail of every single injection, but it is designed to be a nice overview. So the first concept I wanted to talk about was delivering the local anesthetic. And there's this idea of a slow injection being at the rate of one carpule per minute. Remember, we talked about that being about 1.8 milliliters of liquid and one carpule per minute is actually really, really slow, especially when you're administering the injection. You feel like it's taking forever. And you may think, well, the patient probably hates that, and they just rather get it over with. But actually, the pressure from the liquid being injected into the patient's soft tissue can be one of the most uncomfortable parts of an injection. So slow and steady really does win the race in terms of administering local anesthetic. Now needles come in different lengths and diameters. So for length we have the short needle which is about 20 millimeters and the long is about 32 millimeters. Then we have different diameters. So the 30 gauge needle is 0.3 millimeters in diameter, 27 gauge 0.4 and then the 25 is biggest at 0.5 millimeters. And here we have a little um, infographic where the blue is for the 30 gauge and we have the short and long variations of that. Yellow we have the short and long uh, versions of that that's the 27 gauge and then the red is the 25 gauge which is the biggest diameter at 0.5 millimeters and it has a short and long variety as well. So if you were asking for a certain needle, you would call this one the um, 25 short, and this one would be the 27 long, um, just for like a short nomenclature. So those are the more commonly used needles. And the interesting thing here is that larger gauge needles, number one, do not deflect as much, Number two, don't break as often. And number three, have better aspiration. When I say aspiration, that means that you're drawing your finger back on the syringe to check for the presence of blood because you don't want to be injecting local anesthetic directly into a blood vessel. It's not going to be very effective if you do that. So aspiration, um, and I also mentioned less deflection, and uh, less breakage are all qualities that a larger diameter needle has in comparison to a smaller diameter needle. And also, there's significant research out there to say that a patient can't even tell the difference between these three different gauges. So in almost any situation, as you, you're probably drawing the conclusion, it's better to use a larger gauge needle. So the 25 or the 27 is definitely preferable to the 30 gauge needle. Okay, so let's start by talking about specific injections and we'll start with the lower. And for each of these injections, I will place in the top right corner about how much of a carpule of lidocaine is typically administered for each injection. But this is kind of subjective and I definitely wouldn't memorize it for the exam. It's just there for reference and context. And the more, the more important stuff is bulleted in the center, just like always. So let's take a look at this picture and let's get oriented first. We have the upper teeth here, lower teeth, and then the tongue in the center here. And the idea for this injection is, it is a difficult injection, probably the most difficult injection that um, is done routinely in dentistry. As you can see here, it says the highest failure rate. So it is a difficult injection to master. Let me um, actually draw this out. 
there's this landmark here. And it's actually an upside down triangle that you want to aim for the center of. So the outside of the triangle is about here. And this is the coronoid notch. And it's the greatest concavity of the anterior ramus of the mandible, which you can palpate fairly easily with your thumb as seen here. Now the inside of the triangle is running through here. You can see this band of tissue here, which is called the pterygomandibular rafe, which is a band of tissue usually pretty visible, especially if the patient is opening really wide, which is a good thing to do when you're administering this injection. And it connects to the buccinator muscle anteriorly and the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle posteriorly. And lastly, we have the upper limit of the triangle, which is up here by the maxillary molar teeth. So the idea of this injection is you approach from the opposite or contralateral premolars. You aim about one and a half centimeters above the mandibular occlusal plane and usually parallel to that plane. And this will put you around the center of this triangle and you would advance the needle slowly until you contact bone, which would be part of the mandible. You withdraw about one millimeter. You aspirate, which again is pulling back on that syringe to check for blood. And then if it's a negative aspiration, you don't get any blood back flowing into the, the um, carpule, then you can slowly inject. And again, that's about one carpule per minute. So slow insertion, aspiration, and slow injection are a key component and are true for all of the injections that we talk about. And also, I just wanted to mention, you never want to insert the needle up to the point where you can't see it. And this component is called the hub. So you never want to hub a needle because there's a much higher risk of that needle breaking off. So back to the IAN block, this one numbs all mandibular teeth in that quadrant. So let's take a look at this really handy um, diagram here. And in green is everything that is blocked by a successful IAN block or inferior alveolar nerve block. And again, it numbs all the mandibular teeth in that quadrant. And when I say teeth, I mean the pulps that are supplying those teeth. If the lingual nerve is also anesthetized, which is a little bit more superficial to the, or the IAN is branching off into the lingual nerve, that will block this half of the tongue. So you can often ask a patient if their tongue is starting to feel a little bit tingly, that means you've probably got a successful IAN. And you also, uh, also notice how the IAN also numbs the lips and gingiva facial to these teeth, but they don't, doesn't block the soft tissue buckle to the molars. So that's interesting, but you can numb it with the next block we're going to talk about. And before I move on, um, these terms are fancy names for different types or variations on the IAN block. You have the Halstead, which is the classic Gal Gates is an open mouth method where the patient opens really, really wide and stays open after the administration. Akinosi is a closed mouth method. For the exam, that's all you need to know. It's kind of outside the scope of the video. We're talking mostly about the Halstead um, method when we talk about what we just went over. So again, back to this, we said the IAN blocks the mandibular teeth in that quadrant, this half of the tongue, and the soft tissue facial to the premolars and anterior teeth, but not buckle to the molars. And that is covered with a buccal nerve block. And this is done in tandem or alongside the IAN block. And for this one, you inject buccal to the terminal molar, approximately parallel to the mandibular occlusal plane, to get the long buccal nerve that supplies that soft tissue buccal to the molars. All right, next we have the mental nerve block. And for this one, a key component is first with your finger, locate the rubbery neurovascular bundle that, that exits 
this mental foramen, which is the hole that's about, I'd say a good landmark is um, around or apical to the second mandibular premolar or between the apices of the two mandibular premolars. So you insert the needle just anterior to the foramen, aspirate, and slowly inject. And this one is going to numb the soft tissue facial to the premolars and anterior teeth. But it won't. It won't numb the actual teeth. In order to numb the actual teeth, we need an incisive nerve block. And this is exactly the same as a mental nerve block, except you hold pressure right on that foramen for two minutes after the injection to literally force anesthetic into that mental foramen. And that's going to be able to bathe the incisive nerve, which is a branch that supplies um, usually the anterior teeth and usually both or maybe just the first premolar, but usually both premolars. And that way you can get pulpal anesthesia. So same as the mental nerve block, just with this component of adding pressure with your finger. And that is after you administer the injection. So that's it for the lower um, local anesthesia injections that I wanted to cover. So let's move to the upper now. So first, we're going to talk about the posterior superior alveolar block, or the PSA block. And this one is going to numb the maxillary molars. So this one's a little bit tricky technically. First, you would palpate for the zygomatic process, um, basically the cheekbone, and you aim posterior to that. So as you can see in this picture, you retract the cheek with, a non with your non-dominant hand. You inject into the mucosa around the second molar, and you maintain a 45 degree angle to the occlusal plane and a 45 degree angle to the vertical plane. So a lot of 45 degree angles for this one. Once you inject, you swing, or once you um, insert into the mucosa, you swing the syringe laterally to again attain another 45 degree angle so that you can wrap around the back of the tuberosity. So as you can see, you are pretty close to this, um, this grouping of blood vessels here. So this one has a very high hematoma risk, and that is something that could be asked on the board exam. And another thing they like to, um, or at least I've seen on, in a couple practice problems, this idea of a 16 millimeter depth, and knowing that number specifically, um, I, did, I have seen that um, being asked before. And this is, as we talked about, the long needle. That long length is 32 millimeters, so about half the length of a long needle. Or just using a 20, uh, 20 millimeter short needle so that you can avoid having this, um, you know, poking around and piercing a lot of these blood vessels, getting a um, hematoma forming here. So that's something you can avoid with proper technique. Now something you may have picked up on, this PSA block affects the uh, maxillary molars and, and the tissue buckled to it. It doesn't show it very well in this picture. But you notice this, this mesiobuccal cusp of the first maxillary molar is in green. And that is, it's a pretty odd situation here. But there's a 25% chance that this PSA block covers all three molars in completion. There's a 75% chance that the PSA block leaves out this mesiobuccal cusp because it can be supplied by the MSA or the middle superior alveolar nerve. So for the first maxillary molar, the majority of the time you need to do a PSA block in addition to something else. But we're going to talk about how you can get around that completely. Just an interesting uh, phenomenon to point out. So what you could do is an infraorbital block. And so this one blocks the maxillary anteriors and numbs the, the premolars. So basically, uh, in other words, all the teeth that the PSA block did not cover. 
So both the ASA, which is the anterior superior alveolar nerve, and the MSA, the middle superior alveolar nerve, are anesthetized, which are both branches of the V2, or maxillary nerve. And so your landmark for this one is the infraorbital foramen, which is just under the orbit. Um, it's on the inferior border, border of the orbit. And you can actually palpate um, your own with your finger. And um, just don't follow this, uh, this clinician isn't wearing gloves. It's not a, not a great um, idea. But otherwise, um, that's about the idea for what you're looking for. So the ASA supplies the anterior teeth on that side and the associated facial mucosa in orange here, and the MSA supplies the premolars, and 75% of the time, the mesiobuccal cusp of the maxillary first molar and associated facial mucosa. All right, so next, the greater palatine nerve block. I actually like this one quite a bit, but it took a little bit of getting used to. So this one blocks the posterior hard palate. In this image, it's um, shaded in orange. And your landmark is the greater palatine foramen. You may be thinking, so how do I know where to aim this one? Because any injection on the palate is typically very painful, probably among the most painful of the injections that we administer because that palatal mucosa is so tightly bound to the bone underneath. And so when you start injecting, um, it's it feels like the tissue's almost tearing off of that bone for the patient, and it's so much pressure buildup. So you really want to make sure that you're aiming in the right locations. So this foramen is generally located halfway between the gingival margin of the second molar and the midline of the palate. And this aiming is, um, is ideal, certainly perfect. But there is, as with anything in dentistry um, or, or medicine in general, a lot of variation from patient to patient. So the best way to search for this foramen is to use a cotton tip applicator um, and before you even grab the syringe, take this applicator and push gently where the alveolar ridge meets the hard palate. So this little nook here, you kind of work your way back and you keep gently pushing, gently pushing, and you'll eventually get to a part where the tissue feels kind of spongy and dips down just a little bit. And that is your target. And it should generally lie around the landmarks that I mentioned, but it's a great way to really make sure that you're aiming in the right spot. And then this cotton tip applicator has another purpose. So once you find that spot, use this Q-tip to apply pressure and tell the patient, basically this is what they're going to feel during the injection. And this will help them get used to that sensation of a lot of pressure. So, I typically hold it for almost a minute, and it really helps. Um, and, and you can put a topical anesthetic on the cotton tip applicator and just kind of hold it there and push it for about a minute, and it really helps them get used to that sensation. Also, while numbing the um, superficial layers of that mucosa. And then while holding pressure with your non-dominant hand with the cotton tip applicator, you inject with your dominant hand while pushing down and then gradually release pressure from the Q-tip. So again, this nerve block uh, numbs the hard palate on that side from the premolar back. And this is um, a critical injection to do if you were, say, doing an extraction of a posterior tooth um, because you really want all of the soft tissues associated with it profoundly numb during the extraction. All right, and then we have a somewhat similar nerve block, and you can you apply all of those um, tips and tricks that I just told you about with the greater palatine nerve block for the nasopalatine block. And this 
is in green. It covers the rest of the hard palette from K9 to K9 bilaterally. And this one is probably the most painful because this one, in addition to that extreme amount of pressure that you feel, it's also just a really, really sensitive area. And so you inject where the palatal soft tissue meets this incisive papilla here. And some clinicians like to do this technique where you inject um, from the facial papilla between eight and nine, and you start to um, go a little bit further, go a little bit further, and then um, get that area a little bit numb to start with, and then do your direct nasopalatine block. So that's another way to do it. Again, there's a, there's a bit of subjectivity here, and it's basically whatever feels best for you, what, what's best in your hands, but there are a lot of different techniques to choose from. All right, and lastly, we have the local infiltration, which is used for both the upper and lower arches, and it's probably um, one of, if not the most common, anesthetic technique used maybe only second to the IAN. And so this is used um, when you enter in the vestibule. So you aim for the depth of the vestibule and you're basically aiming for the root apex. So for this one, you're trying to deposit local anesthetic so that it can diffuse through um, the bone and numb that um, the nerve that's entering the pulp of that tooth to attain profound anesthesia. Now this one works best in the anterior because that's where the facial cortical plate is thinnest and you'll have the best rate of diffusion of anesthetic. Um, also to note, septicane or articane is usually the drug of choice for a local infiltration because it has the best bone penetration. Now, while this is used for um, used for single teeth in the anterior, it also can be used in the posterior, like uh, especially in the maxillary, um, or as an adjunct to a block, like the IAN block in the mandible. So just a great technique, a great anesthetic, um, great just anesthetic location for you to use for. Uh, attaining profound anesthesia. And just for your own review, here's the full label diagram that we've been using throughout this video so you can review all of the different injections that we covered. All right, and that's about it for local anesthetics. Um, the next video we will cover antibiotics uh, to continue our talk on dental pharmacology. But I hope you found this video uh, helpful and interesting. Um, thanks as always for all of your support. If you liked this video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already for more on dental pharmacology and all things dentistry. Thanks again for watching guys and I'll see you all in the next video.